Hi, I'm Agabayer. Hi, I'm Shani Person. Welcome to The Deep Dive, a monthly culture lab podcast where we dive headfirst into a topic that is crucial for building thriving cultures at scale. Join us as we geek out and explore the intricacies of culture, discussing everything from the latest trends to timeless philosophies. With each episode, we take a deep dive into a specific area, offering unique perspectives and insights on how to create and sustain a culture that fosters growth, innovation, and success. Whether you are a business leader, HR professional, or just someone interested in understanding how cultures work, the Culture Labs Deep Dive is the show for you. So sit back, relax, and get ready to take the plunge into the fascinating world of culture with us. And today we're going to talk about a culture of care and prioritizing mental and physical well-being at work. I can't wait to share the conversation that we had with Shani, but first, a quick announcement. We are really close to wrapping up our long-awaited Codifying Company Culture Accreditation Program. It's a program for culture practitioners, and there are literally decades of work in the field of culture that led me to develop this unique methodology. We have been testing and improving it continuously for the past six years, and our clients really love this approach. I think there's nothing quite like tapping into the wisdom of an entire organization and harnessing the power of stories to codify and improve your company culture. In fact, we had so many requests for this type of work from various client organizations that we can no longer meet the demand with our current internal capacity. And this is why I decided to share the methodology with the first cohort of practitioners outside of the Culture Brain Consulting. If you are in charge of codifying your culture, or if you are a consultant who supports clients in the process, this is definitely a program for you. If you'd like to learn more and perhaps get on the waiting list, go to tinyurl.com forward slash accreditation program. And there is a link in the show notes. Shani, welcome to the deep dive. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here again. I know. It's so much fun. It's something that I genuinely look forward to every month. And this month, May, is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so I would like us to do a deep dive into this topic. In fact, in, in the community that we run in Culture Brains, we are dedicating the whole month to something that we call culture of care. And we are basically looking at prioritizing mental and physical well-being at work. So I guess probably a good jumping off point for this conversation would be to ask you, what comes up for you when you hear the term culture of care? It feels like a hug. Uh <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> the words that come up for me are being seen. And there's also something I think around expectation versus reality, which is, you know, embracing the fact that we are human. Yeah. All the time. And for me, care, there's something around that, that whatever space I step into, I'm always human. I'm always carrying with me a lot of things, experiences, thoughts, accumulating different difficulties or great things and we can't always leave it and just put on this like suit of professionalism. And so for me, care is, is about giving people the choice to bring that. You can't force anyone. Not everyone's sure. comfortable bearing their soul. And, but I think just feeling that it is okay yeah. to be who I am and where I am having that environment of, I think we talked about before also, like trust and agency mm -hmm. to move through different things. Yeah, we did talk about it when we talked about building a resilient culture. And I so agree with you. And first of all, I'm so glad that we will not be talking about table tennis and <laughs> Friday pizza parties when it comes to wellness. This is the reason why we vibe so well together that I was sure that you wouldn't mention any of those things when, <laughs> when it comes to culture of care. Thank God. Why do you think that is? Why, 
when we have this conversation about well being, there is so much focus on the frills and the perks and, you know, the massage therapists coming into the office. Why don't we look at the essence of what it means to be a well functioning, a thriving human in the workplace? My first feeling it's hard. It's much harder to look at how you build trust and how you create space for autonomy and how you actually meet people than it is to create an event. As much work as it can be, I mean, and I've built, I've done big events. Sure. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it's not that type of work. It's not confronting. It doesn't demand the same thing of us. These types of activities demand participation on a very superficial level. But care in a deeper essence demands connection. Beyond the participation is also centering relationships. And that can be really challenging. That can be really challenging. And I think it goes back to our human nature. I had this conversation actually today with my personal trainer. I mentioned before we started recording that I started this new workout regime and I have a new personal trainer. And we had this conversation about human nature and how we always gravitate to shortcuts. And, oh, you know, I was testing him as well. Like, is there an easy way, you know, and how fast can I see results? But how fast will I see that I'm stronger or whatever? And he's like, listen, it takes time and it takes effort and there are no shortcuts. And of course, I know that. But human nature is to try to do the easy thing, hoping that perhaps there is an easy solution, a solution that doesn't require us to be vulnerable, to be consistent, to do the hard work. And clearly, it's easier, right, to buy a few table tennis tables or organize an event, as you say. And it's also so, so transactional, right? There's a beginning and an end to it, and then you've done it and you can tick it off your list. And I think it also brings companies and people a lot of satisfaction because it's tangible. And very often the stuff that we talk about, creating that environment where people can bring their humanity for humanity to the workplace, it's not really tangible. And so it's like, oh, I'm not even entirely sure what I'm supposed to be doing here. And I was actually very curious about this. So we interview a lot of people as part of the projects that we do with companies. And one of the questions that I always ask as part of these interviews is tell me about a time when you felt like you were thriving at work. It's a very open-ended question that is, of course, free to interpretation, right? Because what does thriving at work mean? It means for sure a different thing for every person. And what was really interesting for me is that there were some themes that were emerging from these conversations. And we're now talking about maybe even thousands of interviews, actually, we need to count in dozens of organizations. And we've realized that when it comes to the workplace, people actually don't come to the workplace to work out, <laughs> surprise, surprise, to play tennis. They don't come to work to uh, drink beer and have a pizza, they come to work for a different reason. And it's usually to have a sense of meaning and fulfillment, like feeling that I'm a part of something larger and meaningful. They come to work to find a supportive community that is stimulating and interesting. They come to work to solve interesting problems. And this is where our sense of fun derives from. So that's why we talk so much about fun, meaning and belonging at Culture Brain, because these to me, are the three pillars of thriving cultures. And they are so directly linked to well-being in the workplace because they create that environment that you talked about where people can show up as human beings, but human beings in a certain context, right? Because I don't know how you think about this, but I'm thinking about work as just part of life, an integral part of life. But it's different than other parts of life, and it's okay. We don't need to do everything that we do outside of work, at work. I don't necessarily feel like when we are working that we need to try and pack all these activities that we would do in our so-called personal lives. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. That's part of also growing up and realizing kind of where do I bring what? And not everything gets to play out in every environment. I'm a parent. 
I don't use a lot of my professional skills with my children, and some I do, actually. But not every part of us comes into play in, in every situation. And I think, you know, that's perfectly fine. I do, however, wonder a little. I hear what you're saying around this, that we don't bring everything, all of our outside activities. But then we also do see that employers have sometimes a really high level of demand on the commitment that they are desiring from employees, how much time they're spending, so much so that there isn't space for the other things in their life. And as much as, you know, we're all each responsible for our own balance, that also makes me curious kind of where is that point for a company where they kind of not take ownership, but be part of that dialogue and part of that balancing act for a human, Mm -hmm. as in taking care of all the things that we need to be able to be thriving. Because we do have bodies beyond. A lot of us, you know, some of us go to work and work in production or work in a physical job. Then we definitely need our body. But we also need our body for our mind to work. So yeah, I'm always curious about that balance. Because as you say, I I also hear about all these workplaces that set up the yoga lunch and set up this and nobody comes because it's not the perfect timing for them. And it's not the thing that they want to do. But what does that look like instead then? I know. I know. This is such a great point, Shani. I honestly couldn't agree more. It can seem like quite a difficult task because obviously balance looks different for different people, right? And there is even a graphic from Lise Fosslin, I think, that has been doing the rounds of the web. And I think I even shared it on LinkedIn, where she illustrates this very nicely visually, that balance is different a different thing to different people. Some people are more like fluid, so they will weave everything in together somehow. For others, it's interspersing activities, others like rigid boundaries. So long story short, what I'm trying to say is that I think it's an interesting question for employers. How can we meet all these needs because people have different styles? I would be curious if you have any examples to share. One thing that I know of one company that did this, I think, brilliantly was one of the things that they held their managers accountable to is to have these well-being talks, I think they were called, with their team members. And they were also supposed to use some sort of a well-being budget and take days off. And they had extra days off in their company. So they were really facilitating extra time for people to charge their batteries and stuff like that. And they were incredibly consistent about having these conversations and holding people accountable to doing the thing that works for them. So it wasn't like the company was prescribing, you know, you need to go and, I don't know, to a retreat in January. But managers would have these conversations and they would be setting in collaboration with their employees goals for their well-being as well, not just goals in terms of, you know, business results. And this was part of the performance conversation when you sat down, however frequently they did it, like, how did you do, you know, on your OKRs? But, But there was also a conversation, how well did you do on your wellness goals? I like that. Yeah, I wonder what you think about this. Is it too patronizing? (laughs) Or what do you think about this approach? Does it resonate with you? Uh, Yes, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. Before this conversation, I was thinking a little bit about well-being and just what's actually the plate that it stands on, what is actually needed for people to be able to feel good. And that's beyond physical, also mentally. And a lot of the words that came up for me, as we said before, they're not concrete. There is no one prescription. There's not one way to to do it. I sometimes, I think it would depend or will depend on how we execute because I, I sometimes think we want to like control our way into something that we can't control. And a lot of actually well-being is trust, is leaving space for people to make decisions. Yeah, autonomy. And being in that balance of like, checking in with people rather than checking up on people. Yeah. So yes, and it can be a good base for conversation. And it would depend, I think, how a person uses that in the discussion and how that is received on the other side. Is it received as if, oh, you're just trying to 
find a, a reason to point your finger at me or are you actually genuinely caring? Yeah, yeah, I love that because I think it shouldn't be another control mechanism. And it might be a nuance, but what you have just said, you know, the difference between checking on people and checking in with people, that this is actually a world of difference. And also, you know, genuinely caring helps, <laughs> right? Because I think when you genuinely care about people's well-being, it comes across differently as well. I'm not trying to say that some managers don't genuinely care because I think in actual fact, I think that there are very few terrible human beings who hate other human beings and our managers. I just think that people are not intentional enough about creating a great environment for others. So if you can tap into your human needs to care about others and do it in a way that brings it across, I think you probably can't go wrong. And I appreciate it, you know, I appreciate it. I remember Anis, one of our team members, at some point in time, it was summer holidays and I didn't take any time off. I was working throughout the whole summer. And it was September, I think, when we had this conversation and he was like, are you okay? I mean, yeah, sure, sure. And he's like, no, are you okay? I mean it. Like, and that made me stop and think. And I really felt, you know, that genuine sense of care. Like he really wanted to know, am I still coping? Am I doing okay? You know, am I tired and so on? And that was really touching because it made me realize, actually, I've been driving myself a little bit too hard. And this little question led me to some changes. I started taking time for myself. I started working out at that stage. So it can be really powerful when you bring that authentic sense of care for people around you. I was actually reading about a study, and I can't remember who wrote it now, but it was just on that, how much of a difference there can be between mechanically showing care and genuinely showing care. And actually, if it is mechanical, then it doesn't really produce any impact. It is really, really important that the care is genuine and that you feel that it's coming from that place of actually wondering, how are you really? Yes. Exactly. Shani, shifting gears a little bit here, but of course not entirely. I'm curious, do you have any personal stories of mental or physical health issues that were connected to work? Mm, yes. Uh, when I, I graduated from university in London at 24, 25, I went to work for a small startup and uh, I was already pushing myself quite hard. I've always been the A student, you know, very always wanting to ace all the achievements, get all the good grades. And I think, I, you know, I, I came into that setting not entirely in a good place, but that definitely drove me over the edge. Looking back, I know I was completely burnt out, which is not a great first experience to your, to your post-university career, so to speak. But I definitely was struggling to get up in the morning. I was struggling to find motivation. And this was also an industry where it was expected to work hours and hours. I remember I was working with a research executive and we were looking through a report that I was writing and it was at midnight. And we were looking through it and she goes, let's check you back in in two hours and see if you've made these corrections. And I just went, no, I'm sorry. We can check in at six if you want in the morning or seven, but I need to sleep. <laughs> I, I can't. At that point, you kind of stop listening to your body. You just are kind of trying to tick the boxes when actually, you know, when you do take the rest, when you do take the breaks, when you do stand up for your own boundaries and your own needs, that's when you can come in in the morning and do something in half an hour that took you three hours doing it at night when you're tired and exhausted. So yeah, I, I definitely had a really tough streak and it led me to quit. There was no care provided by this employer. Yeah. So yours was burnout. I have a story of anxiety, which I will share happily in a moment, but I want to kind of unpack what you learned from that experience, especially, you know, given the fact that most of our listeners are people who are looking for ways to improve their culture. What are the red flags uh, for someone who works with a team 
to kind of identify that people might be struggling with burnout or might be close to burnout. What you have just described, I think, is a clear sign that there was no <laughs> no interest in that company to prevent burnout. But I also know that there are genuinely situations where employers, leaders care and don't want people to experience burnout, but it's not always visible immediately, right? It's not like you see it out there. So I'm curious, because you've been through this experience, what are the early signs that people can look for to prevent it from happening and avoid losing a really talented, amazing person? Because you said you quit, and I think anyone would in a situation like this, and I think this is what often happens. Very humbly answering this question can only speak from the experience that I have. And I know there are probably people out there who are much more experts on this topic. I do think that there will be lots of different reasons. I'm just thinking of the scenario, I think. There are always these scenarios where people take a lot on. They put a lot on their plate. And sometimes it is that they have a lot combined with their private life and their work life. And sometimes it is that they're piling it on only in one scenario or the other. And that's why probably care comes into play and dialogue and connection, because when you know these things, then you can also see when people are starting to feel strained or look very tired. Or in my case also, I don't know what to call it. There's also this quality of being really, really worried about the quality and is it, is it going to be done? Is it going to be finished? And there's this like very hyped up sense of that everything is really, really important. Again, coming back to our previous conversation, we're, of course, ultimately always responsible for ourselves. But I know also from a point of leadership that sometimes helping people like remove things and prioritize and pinpointing focus, trying to also lessen the importance of some things can be a really powerful tool for prevention, I think. Yeah. When you're in that state of mind, it's really, really hard to distinguish between what's honestly completely useless and what is life altering important. Totally. And leaders don't make it easier. Everything seems to be up there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think especially in the startup environment that, that you had your experience in, Typically, my experience, and of course, it's a generalization, which by definition will not always be true, but I see a lot of startups and scale-ups just, you know, chasing every shiny object out there and everything seems super important. Of course, everything moves super fast. And so leaders are definitely not helping people to focus on the real priorities because they're not always clear. And it's such a great and practical thing, you know, to think about. And I also unpacking what you've shared, apart from this tactic or strategy, just, you know, help people basically identify what's a must have, what's a big rock and what is not. You said something interesting about kind of noticing some of the signals seeing your team members. And I think, you know, you say someone might look tired or whatever. I think generally probably a good thing to look for is, is this person diverging from their baseline? Because there are some people who are always, you know, switched on and very quick and very responsive. And suddenly they're not like that. I think this might be a good sign that something's happening or vice versa, depending on what the baseline of the person is. So if someone is sort of more consistent and steady and with attention to detail, and then suddenly something's changing, I think it might be a good thing to look for as well. And an early red sign, anything basically that goes away from what we consider a baseline for this person. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so as well. Ironically, like the lesson that I personally took away from that was nobody's going to tell you to work less if you do a good job. And so actually, as I stepped into more leading roles, I actually tried to invert that realization. So how do I help people know when to quit or when to stop or when it's enough or when it's good enough? Because it's really easy. And I think especially in London, it's a competitive environment. You know, I was constantly chased by this feeling. If I fail at this, if I don't do well, there are 200 people more competent than me, at least outside the store, just ready to come in and take the job. And that chase alone can be also really, really threatening, really, really stressful. So I actually try to invert that thinking also a little and go, yeah. Totally. I think this is why 
belonging is so important at work. And the first level of belonging that we've identified, which is just creating an environment where people can feel valued, accepted, and heard and seen for who they are as a person rather than what they do is such a vital thing, right? Because I think for a lot of us in the workplace, we start attaching our sense of worth and also the pathway to belonging to how good we are at our job and how much we do. And it can become this hamster wheel of it's never enough, never enough, because basically you are never sure if you are really there yet, you know, and if you are being accepted and if you are part of the tribe. So, yeah, especially in those environments where you're never quite there, you're always some, somewhere on the fringe, but you always need to keep trying. So I love that. I love the fact that it's leader's job, as you say, to help people take the decision. It's enough. It's good enough. And I also think that it's super important to make sure that you make everyone feel seen, heard, and appreciated just for the human being that they are, not only for the work that they're doing. Which is not to say that work that they're doing is not important, right? Obviously it is. And there is a time and place to appreciate that and evaluate that. But it can't be the only thing that people feel appreciated for. No. And I think actually what you're bringing up there is something that I also really like, this distinguishing between being and doing, which in terms of self-leadership is really, really important to know I am not my job. I am not the things that I do. I am valued because... I am me. I am, period. That's valuable. Without doing anything as a baseline, there's value to me in whatever setting or space I step into. Then I also contribute through my actions and my doing, but they are not necessarily always, yes, they are an extension of us sometimes, but it's not me. If something that I do isn't perfect, that's not me. That's the thing that I did. I know when my oldest one was in daycare, very quickly they started helping them with linguistically distinguishing between these things. So don't call the other child stupid. Say he did a stupid thing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean he's stupid. He, he did something that wasn't great. And I think we also as adults forget about these nuances and we get really caught up in and identify with our job and our roles and we care about them. And that's fantastic. And I think, yeah, if we can work more with those differences, then, then there's also more space for continuous well-being, irrespective of how other things are moving and doing. Yeah, yeah, totally. I promised that I would share my uh, mental health story as well in the workplace. And I'll do it briefly because I'm keen for us to move in the direction of tactics and strategies and solutions and stuff like that. So my story is an, about anxiety. Let me quickly say what happened. So I got a job that was a dream job for me. I literally, I was telling all my friends, I would work for them for free and I get to work for them and get a salary. It's amazing. It was one of the top HR consultancies, if not the top HR consultancy in the world at that time. And I felt from day one like an imposter and someone who was not meant to be there or who didn't deserve to be there because all of my colleagues had master's degrees or PhDs from extremely prestigious universities. I was the only person who didn't have a master's degree and who started a master's degree at the same time that I started the job. And I was the only Eastern European and the only, and there were a million of the onlys, basically. So day one, I didn't really feel like I fit in, like I deserve to be there. So of course, as you can imagine, I was prepared to try hard to deserve my seat at the table. And the first day that I joined, I had the so-called uh, onboarding buddy. And my onboarding buddy told me on the first day that I'll be fine as long as I understand who succeeds here. And the people who succeed in this company are people who can bring in client work. So if you can sell projects, you'll be fine. Just don't expect that anyone's going to help you do that because everyone is way too busy. And it's very competitive also because your bonus is going to be bigger if you bring in more sales. And so everyone's trying to bring in more sales. And it's pretty cutthroat. It's like swimming with sharks. 
And basically, we'll figure out if you are made for it or not in a month or so. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was my introduction to this wonderful, wonderful HR company that uh, I was dreaming to become a part of. So I have to say that I was a little bit shaken and shocked. And I blamed him for conveying this message in this way. I still didn't want to accept that it could indeed be the problem of the company culture. Long story short, a few months after that, and I was really hell-bent on succeeding there, I started having really crippling anxiety attacks that I didn't even call them that way. I don't think that I had a language back then to call it anxiety attacks, but I was waking up just, you know, in cold sweat, often screaming in the middle of the night, often uh, on the floor in my bedroom. I didn't even know how I ended up being on the floor in my bedroom. And the only way I can describe the feeling that I had was I felt like I was being buried alive and I couldn't find a way out. It was dark and until I switched on the light, I was just totally freaking out. And then it started happening also in smaller spaces, so like parking lots and stuff like that. I didn't connect it to my work for months, maybe even a year or so. And then I started working with a coach. And as I was working with the coach, I started having dreams. And so I shared it with him. And this recurring dream was that I would walk into our GM's office and he had pictures of his family on his desk in frames, uh, as people do. And one day I walk in and I see my picture on his desk in a frame. And that completely freaked me out. And I was so angry. And I was thinking, I remember thinking in that dream, why am I there framed, you know, on his desk? I don't belong here. I shouldn't be there. I don't belong here. And I told this to my coach and he was like, right. So what do you think your subconsciousness is trying to tell you? And I was still scratching my head, you know. It seems so obvious today and it seems so ridiculous, but I really couldn't make the connection. And eventually what happened was he helped me make the connection. He helped me see that that environment wasn't very healthy for me. And I took a big, 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 big decision to quit. Then we moved countries and I changed companies very quickly. I got cured miraculously simply by changing the company and the work environment. So it would be a huge coincidence to say that it wasn't caused by work. And I thankfully, you know, knock on wood, I haven't experienced it since. I think I've learned my lesson because I did attach a huge part of my self-worth to success and the ranking, et cetera, et cetera. But looking back, that environment, you know, and the way that performance was dealt with and approached was criminal. I definitely know that there are a lot of companies still out there that, that operate this way, that put so much pressure on people and create such a competitive environment where people don't feel safe, they don't feel supported, they don't feel like there is any space for them to grow and learn because, of course, you don't want to look silly, you don't want to admit that you don't know something, so it's just super toxic. And that's one of the reasons, actually, why I'm so passionate about helping companies create a better environment, because I do know that, you know, this company is not an exception. It's probably more of a mainstream still trend that we see out there than, than an exception. First of all, that's a really tough experience. And I've heard a lot of secondhand recounts to similar strategies, which put a huge amount of pressure on people. And it also just made me think of I think we both alluded to a similar thing that there also is this point and which also makes it hard, I think, from the from the corporate standpoint is well-being is driven by the individual. And if we're not on our own acknowledging what the challenge is or what the problem is, and we can't put it into words and we don't dare to look in the mirror and go, oh, I'm burnt out or I'm having anxiety, then it's really, really hard for somebody else to do it as much as you can you know ask the questions and set up the context and the environments and all of that then that also comes down to exactly that that 
you have to make the connections on your own. That just kind of came up for me as I was listening to you as well, that we both touch on this similar thing that only when it clicked for ourselves did we actually move into action for it. Totally. And it really isn't the fact that we've had these experiences is not an exception, right? There are some statistics that are quite shocking when you look at the workplace and how many people have mental health issues. I mean, in preparation for this podcast, I'm not a walking numbers person that can just, you know, quote off the top of her head various statistics. <laughs> I did look at some things in, in prep for that. And one of the things that I found that really shocked me and shook me, I have to say, is that apparently one in six people experience mental health problems in the workplace, uh, work induced very often at any given point in time. So it's like, all six of these people might experience mental health issues, but there is at least one person out of six people who are experiencing a work-induced mental health problem at any given point in time. And 75% of these people do not get any professional help or support. If you think about that, that's scary, right? And I know from my personal experience, I did not get any professional help unless you can consider coaching. And it was, yes. I mean, it helped me realize at least that I was not in a good place and I needed to, to protect myself. So I think from that point of view, actually, I did get professional help. And that was the only thing that helped me get out of that situation because my friends couldn't. We, we did talk a lot about my work environment and I did hear a lot of comments from my friends, you know, this is toxic, you shouldn't be there. But, you know, sometimes when we hear those things for our friends and family, it just doesn't land in the same way. Obviously, people are not qualified to provide us with this help. So how do these numbers blend with you? And what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, they are shaking and also not surprising at the same time. It's terrible to hear the numbers. Even just going back to conversations that we've had previously on this podcast, it wouldn't be unlikely given the amount of change that goes on and the amount of confusion that <laughs> exists in a lot of, of companies, uh, definitely currently. I'm not entirely surprised, but I do see companies who are creating dialogue around self-awareness and around how you lead for that. I think there's a lot of questions that are on the table now that maybe weren't five years ago. And so from that point of view, it's positive. But on the other hand, it makes it all the more urgent, actually, to, to figure out how we, how we deal with this. Yeah. Why do you think people are not getting help these days, professional help? Because 75% is a huge portion of people with mental health issues that are not reaching out to get professional help? Is it a matter of accessibility? Is it a matter of the stigma around mental health? What do you see? The two things you mentioned are probably the two that I, I do see is one, I think, where there's cultural stigma that really makes it harder. I remember I had a friend that I studied with in university and she said, oh, but in Argentina, we all have a psychotherapist. <laughs> like that's just part of our life and vocabulary like, like in new york probably my yeah it's a normal thing that we do and then it can maybe differ from men and women for example so it will also be access from a few different points of view i think a sometimes not knowing there's so much to choose from so many different ways and approaches and I've personally tried a lot of different things because I view it as a developmental activity and I think it's exciting and fun and a good way to get support that, you know, sometimes as much as people love you, they can't give it to you. But I also think, you know, it's expensive. It's very expensive. It can feel like an investment, both monetarily and in terms of how you're feeling. And it's also... I think just going back to something that you were talking about, we were talking about in the beginning, where other things like events are more transactional. When you dip into this, this is a continuous process and you have to be ready to like take on all the things that come up through it. 
we're not always available for that investment also mentally. I know I sometimes choose to go, okay, this is not the moment Yeah, because of different things. So I think access for me is also a bigger question, both in terms of accessibility, visibility, understanding money, but also sometimes that our context might not give us the space to actually go into a a container where we're like breaking down and being sad and having realizations. Totally. Because when you start unpacking, right, I think it's it can be quite disruptive. And that's exactly the conversation that I had with a colleague of mine. It's it's interesting because I think one of the ways of taking away the stigma is to just have open conversations with your colleagues about that. So for example, you know, in our company, people will put their appointments with their therapist on their professional agenda. For me, first of all, when I saw it, it's generally, of course, a gesture of respect. Just I know people and people need to know that I'm not available during that time. But I think it's also, it, it was very encouraging for me that we are not hiding that, right? It's not something that, because you could easily put just whatever appointment instead of saying therapy appointment. So I like that. I think this is one of the things that made, makes me feel proud that we don't stigmatize it. That is absolutely natural. And we have these conversations. And I remember actually a colleague of mine uh, asked me if I considered working with a therapist because of what we're going through with my mom, who's terminally ill. And of course, it's a, it's a difficult situation. And I actually told him, and so I identify with that definitely, Shani, what you said, you know, I can't, this is not the right time for me to unpack this because I need to be there for her, fully functional. And it feels to me that at the moment, it's just not the right time. So I think timing for each individual is super important as well. You're totally right. And also one of the things that I know that companies do, and I think that is super helpful is just making this, just eliminating some of these factors that you've mentioned. So making it available to people. There are companies now that specialize in this, that you basically as a company, you buy the service, you pay a fee for each of your employees, and it's not a high fee per person, per capita. And then each and every single person in your company has access to therapists and coaches and so on, when and if they need them. And I think just knowing, you know, that when you are ready, that when you need it, you can reach out to someone and you have removed these barriers can be extremely, extremely powerful. So we will put a few links in the show notes, by the way, for our listeners, uh, for some of these companies that provide these services, which is when in no way associated with any of them. But um, we know we hear from our community members as well that some of them are quite good. Okay, so I think that we have time for one more question or riffing on one more topic and then we will do our key takeaways. Shani, what what do you want to ask me or like what is what do you think we should discuss as the final thing on this topic? I have one actually. I think that sometimes in this dialogue there becomes like a conflict between well-being and performance. I don't know yes. why and how we kind of see like they don't go together? Totally. What's your view? (laughs) You know, I actually have a theory on this, especially when it comes to the old model, because it struck me, and the company that I talked about is such a great illustration of that, that basically the old model of performance and thinking of performance was this harnessing anxiety disorders uh, for the sake of productivity and performance. (laughs) Right? Yeah, entirely. Yeah, entirely. It's just this whole anxious energy. And so companies were actually thriving on people's mental disorders until they couldn't continue. And then you would just hire a new person and it would keep on basically going forever. I think things are changing right now. And one of the reasons why I say that is we are interviewing people from time to time, depending on on what we work on. Sometimes we will work with a company and interview uh, people who match uh, their ideal employee persona. And we did one of those projects recently. And what was incredibly interesting 
was speaking to people predominantly of the Gen Z uh, generation. There was not a single person who didn't mention in their expectations from the employer some sort of mental uh, well-being support and having good work-life balance. And everyone said that this will be entirely a deal breaker for them if they cannot have these two things in their company. And because the work dynamics and the power dynamics in the workplace are changing, or, you know, talking about talent shortage, and I think a lot of industries are really, really, really struggling to find people. We work a lot recently with the hospitality industry, and it's a disaster. They can really cannot find people to work in their organizations. And so I think that because of that, we are raising the bar now on how we view this because the employees are pushing. But back to your question about what's the relationship of well-being and performance and how I think about this. So I think the system, the old system, definitely believes that well-being is like the second class need and performance rules. And the best way to perform is to be the anxious achiever. But one of the companies that we worked with and did a coaching program in Culture Brain is Exos. I'll put a link to it as well. And Exos is a great organization because they have a lot of coaches who support athletes, like Olympic winners at this level, athletes, but also now they work with organizations and to help people perform, but not athletically, but at work. Uh, But they use the same principles that those superstar athletes would use when they prepare. And the first principle that they shared with us was that you cannot possibly have consistently high performance if you are not resting. So the principle number one for high performance is rest, rejuvenation, and recovery. It's not training. Number one, it's all about recovery. And that's really stuck with me. And I hope that this message spreads because obviously, I mean, we know, we know uh, from the world of sports that if you overtrain, you uh, will not get the results that you want. And it's absolutely the same thing at work because actually when we talk about performance, performance is performance is performance, right? I mean, it's the same thing. It's just that at work, probably many jobs don't require physical strength but it's still a matter of performance. So these are my <laughs> my two cents on the topic. How about you? What do you think? I love that you're bringing up the the sports piece because I think it's it's really ironic that a lot of us look up to these people who have an extraordinary amount of support and strategy associated to their performance and definitely rest and recovery and all kinds of coaching, both mental and physical. And when we go to work, we're supposed to do it without any of that and just act as if we're machines with no needs and no bodies and just churn out things. And similar to you, I'm also seeing I remember going to business school, you know, many years ago, and there was always talk of the strategy of like, well, take people in, you run them to the core, to the bone, there will be either you give them a promotion or they're useless to the rest of the work market because they will have destroyed themselves in the in the process. And I mean, I'm glad I'm seeing less of it and I'm seeing more questioning of that type of strategy, which is definitely, definitely needed. Yeah, I think well-being is performance. It's not a mutually exclusive by any means. They're a requirement for one another, (laughs) for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I have to say, you know, I really had to learn it the hard way because I'm an anxious achiever myself. I don't identify with this anymore because I know that the identity that we attach is is actually driving the way we behave. But but I think definitely I am an anxious re- achiever in recovery. And I'm very mindful of the fact that if given, you know, the right circumstances, I will still be behaving this way. And I think a lot of people, especially encouraged by their employers, fall into this trap of let's do more and more and more and more. And it simply never stops. Okay. So I think it's time for our key takeaways, Shani. 
where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one that's that just is from this very end, I think. Key takeaway, we should treat ourselves more like uh, sportsmen or women. If we can take more of that mindset into how we view ourselves, how we view our leadership, how we view our structures, and what can we adopt from there, I think, in terms of principles, because there are loads, and they've been doing this for years, decades, even. Why not? Why are we not uh, taking and adopting those? I think takeaway for me is actually go look for inspiration outside of the workspace. And as an example in the sports arena, which is a really nice example of combining the more holistic thinking around well-being with with high performance. Yeah, totally. I love it. I love it as a takeaway. Mine then is going to be around the stats that I found. I think it's important to remember that no one is immune to mental health issues. Probably every single person will experience mental health issues and certainly health issues uh, full stop in their working career, during their working career. And what that means for employers is that I think we need to plan for it. We need to, first of all, not contribute to creating these problems in the workplace. That's number one. First, do no harm, <laughs> right? As Hippocrates said. But then it's about just thinking, how can we provide the support that people will need because it's not whether they will need support, but they will. And so, and I'm not saying necessarily that we need to pay, you know, for their therapists and stuff like that, but there are many different ways to support people. So that's one of my takeaways. I love that. And actually to spin on that, I think one of the things that stayed with me is also that there's a switch that's necessary going from a that being like a transactional moment of this is the space we give for well-being and then it's kind of hacked up to being a more continuous thing that we're working with all the time in different ways through the things that we're offering through the dialogues that we're having through the care that we're showing each other on different levels so i think there's something about this going from transactional care to continuous care and what does then that look like at different levels uh, both structural and, and individual one to another and building on this and connected to this this idea of genuine care that we talked about as well so continuous care but also genuine care not the transactional one as you say what it requires of most of us un unless we are sociopaths is just connecting, connecting to our own hearts and being intentional about it because we all have it in us. I think we, our hearts are truly full of love and compassion for other human beings. But for some reason, often we forget that it's part of our work responsibilities to connect and to work with that. So for me, just helping people connect to their human compassion is a great opportunity in the workplace. I don't know, nudges, conversations, setting a certain benchmark where compassion, genuine compassion becomes the norm. Speaking of culture and cultivating culture, I think for me, this is one of the absolute musts in a healthy culture, that it's not considered to be a weakness. It's not considered to be soft. It's considered to be a hardcore business skill and human skill in the workplace. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. It is an incredibly important skill and a muscle, I think, also to, to practice, for sure. Let's go for the last one. Last one. I think the word that then came up for me when we talked also about this balance of control, I always like to think about it as steering versus enabling in terms of these questions, because well-being is so dependent on agency, autonomy, trust, which are words that require space, that require multitudes of perspectives of different people to exist within them. A core thing for me that stayed with me here is also how do we make that pivot really intentional when it comes to this? Of course, think about how we are intentional about creating these spaces for the care and the well-being and can we do it from a place that isn't about control 
but about enablement instead. Uh, I think that's a really, really important perspective always, but definitely when it comes to this. Yeah, so true. So true. Okay, so let me think about my last one. Well, it's this thing, you know, I know that you've heard it many times. I don't think that actually the listeners of the Culture Lab heard this ever before, the three pillars of thriving cultures that have emerged from my research. But I truly think that if you are lost around where to start creating an environment where people can genuinely thrive, just think about these three words and these three ideas, and there is more stuff that you can learn about it on our website. But just asking yourself, how can we create an environment where people can experience uh, more genuine belonging? It's because social death or lack of belonging creates the same reaction in human brains as uh, physical pain. So just imagine how destructive it is to our well-being. So just figuring out how can we foster a sense of belonging in this organization, a sense of supportive community? How can we give people more of a sense of meaning, like what they do matters and helps someone? And number three, how can we create conditions where people can experience the joy of work itself? Because this is how we define work fun, right? It's not about table tennis. It's about experiencing the joy of work itself. I think if you know, if you start working along these three pillars, you are already moving uh, the needle in the, in the right direction. Definitely. This was good. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Anis and Labarawi, production manager. Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. I hope that you enjoyed this new monthly format where Shani and I discuss all things culture. And if you found this conversation interesting or inspiring or valuable, and chances are that you did since you are still listening, you'll also love the conversation that I had with my friend, the brilliant Jeanette Brunet. It was on cultivating the self-care mindset. And Jeanette shares some really practical tips around cultivating a culture of care and also reclaiming our own agency over our personal well-being. If you haven't already done so, please go ahead and follow the Culture Lab podcast in your favorite listening app. And please do me a personal favor. It's a seven second favor, actually. And share it maybe on social media or by text or by email, even with just one person. Just copy the link from the app you're using and tell your friends who want to find new, better ways of cultivating a great company culture. Tell them to listen and then perhaps chat about what you've both discovered. Because when shows like this become conversations and conversations become actions, that's how we transform the workplace together. And if you want to dive even deeper into the topics that we discuss and find like-minded peers who are in charge of culture work in the organization, you might consider joining the Culture Brain community. It's a one-of-a-kind culture accelerator program and a global community of peers that is really shaping the future of work. You can learn more at tinyurl.com forward slash culturebrained, and you'll find the link in the show notes. Thanks again for tuning in. If you want to get free resources on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser, agabayer.com forward slash resources. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, please do it now. That's the best way you can support our work. And finally, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform that you listen to. Thank you. And you are amazing for listening to this point. Not many people do.